Um, he has been part of this uh, thing called Red Bull Music Academy for quite a while now, but surprisingly enough, um, he has never been on this couch here. But yeah, he knows us. Torture. <laughs> nah, come on. It's he, he knows a thing ab or two about Rome, techno, and video games, um, how to run a collective called Final Frontier, how to deal with minor and major labels, and yeah, how to produce a record. So please give Marco Pasarani from Rome a very warm welcome. Grazie. So, but there's also this, this other thing you're an expert of, Marco, pasta. Sure. So what is it? Do you put olive oil in the water and... Nah. I mean, some, some people do that, you know? But as long as you make a carbonara without cream and just eggs, it works. And butter? No. Ah, no way. And, uh, yeah. How and the quality of water, as the uh, title of the lecture says, is quite important as well. That's why when you go to Naples, like, they have a specific kind of water, you know, it comes out better. So if you go to other cities, you bring your own water? Uh, ideally, I would, you know, but it doesn't really work. And then, what do you do? You buy some? Ah, you do it. Maybe you put some extra stuff on top, you know, to hide the uh, the wrong flavor. Ketchup? Not really, but maybe more pepper. <laughs> it might work. And yeah, now we know a bit about pasta, but <laughs> what ab what about techno, Marco? Well, it's a long story, but I think like the mm, you know I've been lucky enough, you know, to grow up to grow up when I was like end of '88 and uh, end of '80s. So around '88, you know, I went, it, it's the period when I really started doing things, you know, and uh, I bought my turntables back then, you know. But I was already like DJing with with friends when I was like 15, doing parties at school and stuff like that, you know. And uh, I've been lucky enough to see the switch, you know, when we were coming from some just music that you were dancing to to <coughs> this thing called house and techno music. So before you played Prince records. Well, that was like kind of my thing, you know, I was quite obsessed, you know, mostly playing just Prince and Apollonia and Vanity and all this kind of stuff, you know, quite a maniac kind of thing. The Minneapolis sound. Yeah, totally. The yeah. times and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. But that was also pretty big in Detroit, right? Uh, yeah, it seems like there's a connection somehow, you know, like maybe uh, I wasn't enough experienced to understand that, you know, that there was a connection. But then afterwards, you know, after a few years, you start learning things and discovering more music and then you see all the picture, you know, like like thanks to uh, to IF, the guy that played the other day, I saw the picture that Italo, Italo Disco actually was really relevant for the beginning of House and we always thought, you know, it was some kind of, you know, related just to disco or or in the case of techno that it was related to the German, you know, electronic music like Kraftwerk or the British electropop and things like that, you know, but then, you know, like we saw slowly, like we uh, found out records that we didn't know at all. I mean, like the Italo disco in Italy was totally unknown. It was music for uh, B-movies, actually, for sexy comedies of the 70s, you know, like... And sexy comedies. Yeah, that's a, that's a proper genre, you know, like you have the police movie that we call it Poliziotteschi, like Roma Man Armata, uh, Il Cittadino Si Ribella, all this kind of dark police movie from the uh, suburbs of Rome, or even in the, I mean, like they were showing all the city, you know, but it was, they were pretending it was like really ghetto kind of thing, you know? And it was this huge genre called like uh, sexy comedy. And uh, it's uh, Edwidge Fanek, this French actress was always there, you know, doing the teacher at school and dropping the pen and doing this, you know, and stuff like that. And actually the music was always Italo disco. So for us, it was some kind of really beat music, you know, no one really took it seriously. But then afterwards, you know, like after a few years, I remember when Ferenc the first time came over, after, he was always playing this dark stuff he played the other day, all the Superman and so all the guys from the squad, they were really excited, you know, like, IF is coming, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the first time he came over and he was playing uh, Alexander Robotnik, Problem d'Amour. I remember everyone was really shocked and, and I, we didn't know the track as well. And we heard this track with the 303 and this, uh, out of time guitar on top of it that it actually quite sucks in a way, but it's beautiful because of that. It was really this pure uh, sound that was like, uh, in a way, really original. The 303 sounded a bit like the Acid House 303, but that was like 83 or something like that, you know, and um, four to the floor kick drum. And, uh, you know, I mean, I think there's a, quite a big connection as well with Italy and techno, you know, like we, we just didn't know at the beginning, you know, and slowly we went through 
all the back catalogs of the uh, labels, you know, like Discotto and this kind of stuff. And but now we see the picture. Do we have the Robotnik thing in here? Actually, I don't have the Robotnik track with me. <laughs> Sorry. Ah, what a shame. <laughs> but yeah, how did you draw the picture then from, from there on? Uh, well, wha what I have to say is that, first of all, I think I have to say a little bit of my, about my background, you know, like that Rome was a city. I mean, clearly it's not a city that is famous for music, you know, it's a city famous for monuments and the Vatican and all this kind of stuff, you know, so. And actually, even in Italy, it was, it was never a city where music was kind of relevant. We didn't have any rock scene, any punk scene, you know, this was all happening in Bologna, Milan or Florence. And, uh, but in but Rome, like... Do you have an idea why? Why not like not it? really, not really. What I know is that we had a club, you know, like called uh, uh, Much More, and there was this guy called Faber Cucchetti that was really a famous DJ in Italy back then, and he was actually our, goth it's the godfather of the Romans DJ, you know, it's the one who was really uh, the teacher for each one of us, you know, like we were all listening to tapes, and the older ones, you know, the me, they were going there to dance, and that was the only thing really happening in terms of a pure Roman thing, you know? And if you, even if you see like the disco in Italy, you know, like in Milan, you had all this electronic disco, uh, Italo disco things. While in Rome, they had like production that sounded like the American ones, you know, like all these uh, people from, um, you know, Claudio Casalini, all the stuff they were producing. I mean, it was more, they were actually to do a 12 inch, they were spending so much money. I was talking to Claudio Donato, that is the guy behind Godi Music, and he was telling me, I mean, we were spending like 12 million lira uh, to make just, the, to record just one track in Rome because they had to invite like uh, American artists and stuff like that to play guitar, to do like sessions and things like that. And, uh, and basically they were really mad with the Milan people because they were spending much less just doing everything, everything electronic. So the attitude was really funk, was really musical. And so was the much more. And that was the only thing that was happening back then. I don't know why there was no, uh, no punk scene, no rock scene, but actually when techno and house music became huge, uh, suddenly, probably Rome was the first city after London to have proper rave parties. Uh, different, you know, not really like this, uh, travelers kind of rave parties. Actually, we were going, I remember in 1990, going in uh, Latina, which is like 50 kilometers out of the city, in this place where old people are dancing lisho, which is, which is a typical uh, dance for, uh, I don't know, my grandfather, you know? And they were doing a rave party in the same place, right after their party was over. So we were standing in the line outside and we could see inside from the windows, this guy is doing that, it was like crazy. It was totally different from England, you know? It was really, uh, how do you say, so uh, disorganized and so improvised, you know, and it was special for that. And I believe that this, I mean, since we didn't have, as I said, any um, big music uh, scene, like this became like huge, you know, like, I mean, it was the very first our own mu movement, you know, and it was pretty similar to London due to accidents somehow, like just two guys going there and uh, being friends of someone in, in unity and buying like the right records and bringing them back in the city. Who, and who were these two guys? Uh, Andrea Prezioso and Lodi D and also Mauro Tannino, the other, the guy that actually, I mean, he's not, unfortunately he died like recently, but Lodi and Andrea, they did like such an amazing job just bringing records that you never heard. And actually those are the guys who started the first Roman label that was called Sounds Never Seen because the, the idea for us, it was like, this, what, what the fuck is this music, you know? Like even right before when the Hesed House was making it into few clubs, I remember like getting tapes from other DJs and stuff and I was just about to start mixing properly and everything and I was getting inspired by the tapes and you heard these things and it just sounded like different, like new like a revolution, you know, and, uh, and basically it was the Acid House from Chicago, all the track stuff, Armando and the Future and all the things that, uh, that we were talking about the other day. Yeah, yeah I, I have mentioned Armando and DJ Pierre, but he didn't have anything with him from them. But yeah, you, you have actually I can play you something because I mean, this bass line here, it's, it actually, it's one of the reasons why I'm still making music. It's like something that when I heard it the first time, I was just like, okay, <laughs> I'm gonna do this the rest for, for the rest of my life. I can't help. And uh, I'm still playing this one. I'm really devoted to this track and I will play it probably forever in every set at some point. Downfall from Armando is, is, coming, is coming on the speakers. And it's this one. Like this.
so and this got you into the process of making your own music totally i mean like clearly i mean uh, it was clear that when this kind of stuff was popular you know like you had the feeling okay i mean i might be able to do this you know and back then i mean like i've been working in a in a record store uh, right after school in the afternoon i was working in this record store but I was taking care of the video games, Commodore 64, uh, let's say, yeah, the, the last days of Commodore 64 and mainly Commodore Amiga. And uh, whenever the boss wasn't, th wasn't there and with the other guys working in the store, we had this little sampler for Commodore Amiga. I was like, what the fuck is this? You know, okay, okay let's, let's, let's try to do something. And the guys that were working with me, they were really like music freaks, you know? So they, they've been introducing me to any kind of stuff from Kraftwerk to uh, Brian Eno, David Sylvia in Japan and all this kind of stuff, you know? And, and the guy would really, I mean, he liked the way I was DJing with this kind of things, you know? And he said, like, we should really try to do something together and mix you know, like a beat with Brian Eno and uh, My Life in the Bush of Ghost, this kind of stuff, you know, that was quite, I mean, obvious, you know, and predictable somehow. But I mean, we were kids, you know, and f fucking around with this. And the software we were using, I don't know if any, any of you have ever seen this, it's like, it's called Traker. It's the, the, it's, it's the kind of software that uh, people used to um, work on to make music for video games. It was just like a very weird sequencer that actually had a very specific way of cutting the samples that was really working back then. I mean, it was really amazing somehow. And uh, whenever the boss was out of the store, <laughs> we were just like doing this like all over the afternoon, you know, with the customer inside. We didn't give a shit. We were doing that all the time. And it was fun because back then it was a normal record store, a, no a record store from the northeast of the city, just a standard record store, selling Ramazzotti, selling Michael Jackson and these kind of things. But back then you could find amazing 12 inch even there it was like a totally different word from now especially like in italy like it's specifically bad you know like there's no chances to buy records in uh, like you would have in london or in cologne or in berlin or wherever back then it was a bit better you know so in a very normal record store in the northeast of the city you know you had this kind of stuff so we were sampling and doing stuff and uh, you know slowly pitting, trying to put things together you know because you know it was fun you know just jamming around but I guess you won't have something out of that period with you, right? I'm sorry? Video, video game music made by you. You mm. haven't got anything. No, actually, period. I never did any video game music, you know. I was no, I mean, I meant with the samples from, from that stuff. No, you know, no, not back then, you know. That we did that later, but <laughs> no, not back then. Back then, I mean, I was just doing that. And uh, being in this record store, it was really fun that we had the chance, you know, to... Uh, to play our stuff to some other, uh, some guys from the local radio station that since techno was incredibly becoming the phenomenon in Rome. I mean, uh, there was this radio station that suddenly did this radio show on Saturday night called Radio Centro Suono uh, Rave and the radio was Radio Centro Suono. And in about two months, like everyone, everyone in the city was listening to this radio station. And uh, they were also having a radio show in, uh, from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the afternoon, so like prime time in the afternoon. And back then we had this huge commercial network from Milan called Radio DJ, and they used to have all the uh, listeners, you know. In about two months they lost all of them because in Rome like something was happening, you know, like the, there was the birth of a movement, you know, somehow, and everyone was into it. Like normal people, weird people, any, any dif different ages, you know, like we're going to the parties and it was such an amazing atmosphere, you know, it was kind of really special. And some of the guys were coming to our store somehow because they were living there and I had the chance to give them a mixtape and a couple of the tracks I was making with a computer and uh, from there, I started to be the kid of the radio station. You know, I was there, they were playing my tracks in the afternoon and playing my mix in the Saturday night, not in a relevant position of the show, but I mean, since there were so many people listening to it, you know, like that helped to, s to speed up the process of getting into the groove, you know, and uh, start playing regularly and invited to a couple of rave parties. I remember the first one playing with uh, DHS, you remember, the House of God? The house, yeah. And the guy was playing live. I think I was one of the few that witnessed that, you know, and uh, it was like the night before Christmas, actually, and he was playing. He didn't know that House of God, I mean, he knew that House of God became huge in the techno scene, you know, but 
it was a guy coming from new wave or a, a different alternative kind of uh, music environment, you know. So he came over and we were all kids dressed like kind of hip hop style for techno. That's the, that was the style back then. How does how does hip hop style for techno? I don't know. Like, like I mean, we were like wearing like large pants and like uh, the, um, sneakers, and it was really kind of mad, you know. Like you say, like if you come to my place, you know, I wouldn't let you in because it was this kind of, you know, boots, you know, and all black and stuff like that. So it was really like this such a uh, early moment you know that even the producer that was really famous was quite different from what was happening back that back then so it's uh, quite interesting you know like it was quite very early and because of the radio because of the store I managed to get into this you know movement somehow and start doing my things and when you say movement techno was the great uh, utopian society for you sorry it was the great utopian society you well, know like yes it was the revolution it was the future it was progress you know like this is changing my life and other spe other people's life you know it was very it was kind of vision you know especially because most of the records coming out were mentioning science fiction and stuff like that you know like the early underground resistance that the IF was talking about they were like really drawing a picture of some kind of future somehow, you know, and uh, as well the early uh, plus eight stuff, like from Richie Odin when it was called Cybersonic or Fuse, they were drawing some kind of a vision of the future, and that was techno for us, you know, it wasn't about the groove like we would say now, it was just about the vision of this future somehow. And I really want to play a track from Underground Resistance that was one of the, uh, not one of the most famous, actually, but it's, it really uh, will give you the idea of this vision of future and uh, back road to Nirvana. That's it. That's it. <laughs> you that back then, this was future, totally. I mean, you were coming from a totally normal, you know, world, you know, and this was when this was happening in the big parties, you know, and it was just like, what the hell is this? You know, we were coming, f we were coming from clubs, you know, and suddenly you see like five, 6,000 people just jumping to this kind of stuff, you know, and hugging each other because it was like this at, at the beginning, you know, it was, <laughs> it was very, it was very, you know, like love, you know, kind of thing, but with this kind of music. But also with like some other stuff, right? Absolutely. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Do you ever get nostalgic listening to these records nowadays? Uh, yes, yes, yes. In a way, yes, it's true. Because techno died in '95, as someone said the other uh, day. Since I know Ferenc really, you know, good deeply since many years, I understand what he said, but it's not true because I mean techno didn't die. Point is that I mean music became much wider somehow, more producers and stuff, and uh, different flavors. I mean there are like in history of music, you know, you have the first original style, then you have evolutions and things, you know, and just techno evolved somewhere else, you know. Okay, maybe if you use the general word at, for, the, for the general meaning of techno, people you will misunderstand you that this happened, you know. But there are still you know good things that happens here and there, you know. But clearly this. This attitude, it was more like some kind of uh, romantic, you know, and it was really, uh, how do you say, uh, was really coming from the heart, you know, it's, it was really pure. There was no idea of business, you know, even though these records were selling much, much more than many business oriented records nowadays, you know, and uh, because of okay, music was more popular, there were record, more record selling and things like that, but, you know, this was a, a very romantic moment, I think, so. But it's different. But uh, speaking of business, you know a thing or two about running your own business as well, right? Mm, where did yeah. you do where it yourself again? Yeah. Well, uh, uh, it all started, you know, because after this radio period, you know, like we uh, there was clearly uh, a breakdown at some point. We went from this small parties at the beginning to huge parties and then promoters started to speculate on parties, you know, so you were going there, they were announcing this art act and it wasn't there, they were saying uh, 70,000 watts sound system and it was five, uh, <laughs> things like this, you know, so basically the movement after a while went down and uh, me and Andrea Benedetti, uh, my ex-business partner, we decided, you know, we should do something. Also because in Rome there was only one label actually one pure one that was sounds never seen as i told you from loridi and it was leoni baldi that was really popular and he was releasing records for acv that was one of this independent label giving you a deal 
like a major label. So just fucking you up, you know, you couldn't get one cent if you were selling nine, uh, nine, nine, 999 copies, you know, you had to sell a thousand, you know, all this crap, you know, and then they were suddenly hiding records <laughs> during the days of the statement. And so, I mean, we decided we might build up our own structure. But I think I should play you just real quick, a couple of Roman things that inspired us as well, you know, so a couple Please. of tracks from Lori. I mean, this is quite intense. Uh, it's quite of a different kind of uh, techno. It's before hardcore and gabber. It's absolutely before that. And it was really, let's say, uh, contemporary to the early Apex Twin stuff. And uh, a lot it was actually probably even earlier tweaking all the scenes as much as, much as possible to create this kind of sonic uh, invasion, sonic devastation of the speakers. He was famous for that, you know. It was, it was literally moving 8,000 people to hear this. Listen, it's pretty, it's pretty weird. Forget about funk for a minute. It's not gonna be funk. <laughs> Common thing they had is the use of the hi-hats. There was a specific discussion in Rome on how to use the hi-hats. And they had to be like, from the 909, no other drum machine, like really distorted but lower in the in the mixing, you know, and um, you know he did that similar to Laurie, but it was much more concrete. So he it's managed. It's like with pasta. Huh? Yeah, it's like specific things, you know. But if you respect them, you know, things turn out better. And what happened to all these guys? Laurie now is back. He's back in the battlefield. I mean, it's. I think he did like 300 tracks that he never released. You know, like amazing stuff, like unbelievable stuff. But he's really like on a different planet. And uh, Leo went too much into this spiral tribe thing, which is, uh, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of these communities called spiral tribe, but those were the travelers, the guys just traveling Europe with vans and bringing the sound system and doing like huge parties, like, I don't know, special acid live show, 18 hours in a row, you know, stuff like that, you know, like really, really, really wild in factories and stuff, you know, and, and Leo went into this kind of, uh, situation for a while and uh, then they disappeared and then he came back you know like it's a different different uh, path while me and Andrea we decided okay since there's no one that cares and gives a shit like Ferenc was saying you know like let's do it uh, let's do it ourselves we decided okay we, maybe we should start you know having our own office import some records that we like you know just selling to everyone you know trying to sell to everyone Actually, I did a, I did a few records before doing this, you know. I did the, mm, four records with Alan Oldham from Generator in Detroit. But you always had this feeling. I mean, back then it wasn't like now that you have MySpace and email and blah, 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 you know. Anytime you had to send something, you know, even making a phone call was like shit, you know, quite expensive, you know. So we decided maybe we should really have our own office and do our own stuff, you know. And that's how we started the Final Frontier. We were, ba we were basically using the money from the record store that this record store in Rome called Remix used to sell lots of records, you know, but sometimes they were ordering too much. So they had lots of stuff in the, um, that didn't sell. So they say like, hey guys. I Overstock. Huh? Overstock. Overstock. So it was saying, if you're gonna sell my records, you know, I can produce your, uh, your, your own label, you know, like I can put some money there, you know. So we were just putting a record, putting it on the phone and playing the records to all the other stores in Italy, you know, trying to clear the stock basically. And uh, because of that, and yeah. that worked. Uh, well, I mean, actually, all the stuff that we were selling and they would thought we were crazy, now it's so popular. <laughs> but I mean, like, it worked. I mean, it 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 actually made us be like some kind of structure that everyone knew. Uh, we did get in touch with different labels because of that, you know, and uh, we increased our circle, you know, like it was getting bigger and bigger. And since we were also selling our record, it was handy to have the distribution. So you talk to this distribution in England and you say, can you sell 100 copies of my record? I will get 50 of yours, you know, for Italy. And they were trading and stuff like that. That Now it doesn't work like this that much anymore. But back then it was like that, you know, with the first Final Frontier, we were going to London to Fat Cat. It was Lee Grange, the best, you know, guy in the record store that I remember. And we were going there, you know, like very humble, you know, with the white label. Um, we have this, can you listen to it? Maybe you want to buy some copies, you know, and, uh, and they were, you know, calling you back a week after and giving, selling, just send me 75 copies, things like that, you know, or, and we were trading stuff, you know, and doing the, 
it, it was really working. I mean, that's how it all started. Without this, it wouldn't be possible, basically, to do the label back then. I mean, we, we were not rich. We started with, I don't know, let's say now 200 euros in the bank account. So we, we needed someone to give us money, someone to trade records, and that, that was the deal, you know? But slowly, we made it happen that we were selling records to 30 stores. We managed to have stuff that was more popular somehow that we couldn't sell because we were too small to sell that. that but we were reselling it to another distributor. All the classic process that was for underground uh, distributions back then. But I mean, like because of this, we managed to do Nature Records and Plasmic Records. And um, yeah, maybe you have some examples of that stuff. I can play the track from Nature Number One, one, which we mostly sold all in Fat Cat and in Rubber Dub in Glasgow. They were keep ordering the record because we didn't have a distribution yet. Um, what is it? Uh, and it was clearly like a post Apex Twin moment, you know, and especially post music, you know, remember music, uh, Michael, uh, Mike Paradinas. So we were quite inspired, I think. But I still like this track, actually. Um, if I find it somewhere. No, then I have to use the one on vinyl. I'm sorry, Raul, I'm going to use your vinyl and I'm not going to fuck it up. This is 1993. So, sounds like a shut up and dance record. Well, I mean, Arcor was quite popular thanks to Andrea Prezioso that it was going to rage in London and, you know, just wanted to recreate that, you know, so, I mean, we were pretty much into that kind of stuff. That was right after the old techno and house thing, you know, we went more into the English uh, productions, you know, and especially clearly the reflex stuff and Aphex Twin and this kind of stuff. And actually when we released this one, I still remember when we received the fax, not even the email, you know, saying like uh, fax from reflex that they were really supporting us, you know, we love your records, blah, 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 you know, and we were excited, you know, when, whenever a fax was coming through, we were like in the stadium, like, oh, like this, you know, because the, the answer was, it was showing up like really slow. So it was really nice and fun. Not, not like opening emails today. Huh? Uh, it can be fun as well, you know, you have to hide it and then you show it out. It's, it's still, the surprise effect is still there. Yeah, and, and talking about all this English stuff, so IDM was yeah. the place where you went next, right? Well, yeah, sure, because I mean, like, uh, the moment, I mean, the stuff became more and more uh, complex and it became the ar artificial intelligence kind of movement, you know, IDM or intelligence dance music, as you want to call it. Somehow in Rome, we, we went all in that direction. I mean, it's not the case that still Aphex Twin and all the Warp stuff, it's the biggest underground mainstream stuff in Rome, you know, and it was really huge. At some point, we were not playing dance classic dance music anymore. I remember doing this party on Wednesday night and it was, like, it was like a very small club, it was about 96 or something, and there was a guy that was playing four to the floor one night and we kicked him out, you know, because I mean, it was never four to the floor, it was always like broken and kind of, you know, difficult, you know, that was the idea, you know, and, uh, and actually it was really working nice. Like stuff like Otecker, it was like, it's still like really, really big, you know. It's one of the places, one of the cities where you go and you see 2,000 people dancing to it somehow. Or Dan dancing to Otecker. Yeah, I listened to my favorite one. That actually was really influential for me as well. And uh, it's from LP5, which is not one of the earliest, but I mean, I think it's just amazing. <laughs> This describes what we were playing on Wednesday night and the club was packed. I mean, it was a small club, you know, 200 people, uh, people were dancing to this kind of stuff. So clearly when we were doing the production, our, our own stuff was kind of getting similar and closer to this one. And uh, yeah, but I mean, you know, we were moving back and forth, you know, to different styles and uh, we had this phase and then we went back to electro thanks to records that we were selling like Doppler Effect or uh, the earliest Anthony Rother kind of things, you know, like they were really popular, or Drexia. Drexia was as well. Who, who were Drexia? Drexia was this, uh, this band or uh, alien forms coming from Detroit. At, uh, actually, no one really knows, but we know, but we don't know somehow. It's kind of this one of these hidden projects, you know, like with all mystery that was one of the best, best, best electronic dance music ever. And I really have to play you this one, and then we, we go to more. <coughs> Uh, things from my label and we stop listening to other people's stuff. 
but I have to play the, uh, play this one, especially if you don't know that. This was the the music on the in our club, basically. So you like a bit of melody? Yes, right? sir. Of course. And um, maybe you can talk a little bit more about, um, or let me put it this way: Would you start a label or a distribution company today? Today, no. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably, I mean, clearly this is something that you cannot really uh, tell. I mean, because when you're, when you're a bit younger, you know, you're really motivated and everything, you know. So I think that being a musician or a producer, whatever you are, I mean, like, I would stick to making music, you know, and not get, you know, any pollution from the business side of it. Because nowadays it's really difficult. It's basically changing every month. There's a different theory on how you should do it, you know. And... Uh, it's not really easy. Back then it was much easier. You just press the record and you send it to someone and, you know, something happens, you know. But now it's just, you know, every week something's different, you know. The distributor tells you, oh, okay, we do the vinyl first, the digital then. And then you do that. No, no, we should do the digital first. Otherwise everyone will put the tracks online and then we won't sell digital. It's like this, like happening every, every week. So, I mean, if you have to do it, you know, just Keep in mind that it's really difficult and will kill your credibility for a while, especially nowadays when distributor can fuck you up easily. Because, I mean, there were like two years ago there was one distributor after each other just going bankrupt and there was a lack of money in all the, in all the um, system. And the one who suffers is the label, actually, because it's the one that doesn't get paid all the time. So it's a quite difficult thing, you know. But I'm proud I'm still doing it, but clearly, you know, I'm doing waves, you know. It's like riding a sine wave somehow, you know, it's just going down, down and up. At some point you can sell more, at some point you just don't sell at all. So you just have to keep it running somehow, because if you just do one record and then you disappear, it's not a label. You have to create a system, you know, proper, proper dis promotion distribution system. And it really, you really need that, you know, it's a... Uh, I mean, there's no way of doing it just, you know, dropping some uh, vinyl and send a few copies over there. I mean, it can work, of course, you know, but... It is different. It's uh, it's quite complicated. So you you have any recommendations on how to somehow swerve your way around all these problems? Well, I mean, just keeping yourself updated, you know, just knowing all the systems. Surely, at the moment, I would just say, just don't do only a digital label because it doesn't make that much sense, you know. Like it seems like it's a virtual. Uh, word, you know, like you think, okay, it's out there, it's reachable by everyone, so maybe I can sell a lot. It is not like that, unless you don't have a very popular track that somehow became popular because you spent money on promotion or because you had someone playing it and, and it became more well known, you know, it's, it's quite difficult. So I would say, I mean, if you really, first of all, if you, uh, you want to do a label, just make sure, first of all, to rise your profile up, you know, somehow, just doing record for uh, music for other labels, so that at least there's um, an amount of people that know you, and at the moment you have the label, you can go to the distribution company and they will be more happy to work on your, on your label because they know your name, so they know that they can count on certain amounts of people buying the records. And, um, and then as well with the digital, you know, I, I can give you lots of, I mean, we don't really need to do this now, but if there's, a, if there's any one of you that is doing this label uh, kind of career and wants to know like few addresses, names and people to get in touch with to sell your stuff, you know, I can, I can hook you up with some people that can, you know, with just one person you can sell to more stores, you know, good ones, you know, that, that they can collect your, uh, your tracks and put it there, you know, I mean, like this kind of stuff I can always tell you, but as a general suggestion, I will suggest to make music and do music for labels that are up and running since longer and more stable and more, you know, and that can actually help you more than if you struggle doing the label and doing the music. Because that at some point it doesn't work unless things go really well. But I mean, reality, it's like things might not go really, really well. So why waste your talent just doing papers? Just make music. and. Let the, the labels do that job. And uh, what is your personal theory of why it's not going well all around? Oh, well, I mean, uh, in now, uh, I have a take about it. I mean, like, since there are more and more producers, clearly there's more music out there. And the more music is out there, the less you sell. I mean, talking to stores and stuff, you know, they're still selling the same amount of records, but the number of titles is double, three times. 
clearly there's less space for new names and people tend to trust more the ones they know or the labels they know. So it's, it's, a, diffi it's a difficult moment, you know, it's not, it's not easy. But at the same time, it's very democratic. Now you can have your track on, just send it to everyone in a second, but it's more like a virtual uh, satisfaction. It's not really happening, you know. It's different from when you were sending a record, right in the, uh, giving the record right to the hands of a DJ, you know, like that, that's some kind of more, you pay more attention, you know. Now, I mean, the mailbox got full of promos, you know, and you don't even manage to listen to all of them. So it is, you know, less visibility because of the uh, huge amount of producers, because now producing records is easier. When we were producing a record back then, we had to buy the drum machine and this and that, and you don't find the 909 and you don't find that. Now it's just softwares mostly, so it's a bit easier. It's a bit more accessible, and it's an amazing thing because it's democratic. Everyone can say what they want to say, but at the same time, it's just a bigger ocean where you have to swim. So it doesn't make it easy. And, and why did you say that if you start a label, um, be prepared to lose some of your credibility? To? To lose some of your credibility. No, Cre creativity. 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 Creativity, yeah. yeah. So Because if you run your own label, of course, you have to deal with stuff that it doesn't belong to music. I mean, when it comes to promotion and selling and uh, accounting, I mean, you forget about music for a few days and even longer than a few days. Even through, even through, even if you go through like some very good uh, business, you know, like it might happen. And even if it's good for your music, it will take you out from music from music for a while, you know. So just, I'd be careful about it, you know. I would make music, you know. I mean, when someone has a talent, you know, and uh, just let other people with different talents to take care of the, of, of that. But I mean, if you really feel about doing it, like I've been doing and I'm still doing, you have to do it. But be ready to be a soldier, a fighter, because it's a, it's a war. It's a war. So, and what keeps you doing it then? If you could easily say, I don't care about the business side, I sell my stuff to other labels. It's true, but I've been working like 15, 17 years to build something that now maybe it's different because the reality is different and I still want to do that and somehow. I'm with different times, you know, like maybe I do it for a while and then I just switch to the studio and spend there six months and just make music. I just want to do it. I mean, I still love to get the record. I mean, even though I'm playing Serato Scratch, I still love to press records and yeah, it's, it's something that it's addictive. You just cannot stop it. Yeah, but how, do, how does it get together then, playing Serato and still... I still buy records, so uh, the fact I'm playing Serato doesn't mean that I don't like records anymore. I mean, it's uh, it's just something that I do because I can edit tracks on the fly, have more stuff with me, not breaking my back too much. I've been doing it for 17, e 17 years. I'm allowed to play Serato Scratch. <laughs> okay. And, um, yeah, you've, you've also worked with some different labels throughout your career, right? Yeah. So you've not only been putting out stuff on your own, yeah, Little. because as I told you, as I was suggesting, I mean, working with other labels bigger than yours, if they like your music, can help you, you know, just doing better with your label as well. And uh, I did, I've been working with many labels, with, uh, with Generator, with uh, Scam, uh, Ant Zen, and uh, the latest one actually is Peace Frog. And uh, I'm working with them again, but I did an album with them, like uh, four, three years and a half ago, four years ago. And it did really well, and actually it helped selling all other all the other records we do, we did on our label. You know, like we've been, <laughs> you know, just throwing the stocks. It worked. So, uh, so proof to your theory, then. Yeah, I mean that that's that's quite a bit, quite evident. You know, like because they can reach a bigger audience and everything. So your names goes around more and more, and a distributor might pay more attention to your label as well. So I think you know that's the first step. And you have something from that album? Yeah, I play you the track that was the most known on the album. Actually, in the album, it's just the hidden track, but we had a 12 inch. And, and it's some uh, kind of hip house, huh? Uh, not really. It is, if I find it. Uh, no, 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 no. Okay. There's no way to... Ah, there we go. Sorry. So with records, you could search for the cover now. Uh, <laughs> I have some pictures. So this is you with the vocoder, then? Uh, 
uh, not really. <laughs> well, it's clearly a mashup, and uh, that was not meant to come out somehow, you know. But you know, they wanted to do it. It's the English way of doing it, you know, and they did it, you know, the bootleg kind of thing. And um, you've also had some negative experiences with other labels, right? Well, I mean, negative in a way and positive in another. I mean, like, you're surely talking about the Jolly Music experience. And uh, I've been producing, like, there are two guys that I'm working with since many years called Marian Francesco, and they are well-known, quite well-known as uh, Jolly Music. That was a project we did on Nature, on my main label. And uh, at some point, you know, like, we were selling quite good, you know, really amazing press and everything, blah, 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 you know, just... What, what, what was the inspiration? Jolly um, Music, the flea market. Music. Just music coming from the flea market. So records, you know, like fucked up records, records from the back of the dolls, you know, trying to put them on the turntable and stuff. It's big collage of weird things and clearly Italian soundtracks and uh, all this Michalizzi, Umiliani, Piccioni kind of thing, you know. And uh, the record was just an amazing record that for us was really like some kind of uh, masterpiece, you know, but really, arty somehow but at some point someone that was thinking about money and not art just called us you know and uh, it was this guy from emi in the in the uk and actually they wanted to license the record you know so we went through the, all the process and and everything we were shocked you know it's our chance for the life you know this would change our life the deal was unbelievable it was like a very 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 good deal you know, but yeah, since when you're uh, independent, you know, sometimes you don't really know that much about the major label uh, system, you know, so uh, you have to get a lawyer, spend lots of money and do this kind of stuff, which is all new to you. Dropping the distribution work, you know, because you think, you know, this is it, you know, I can just work on the project and everything. You know, but then at the end, you know, you have this major label spending, I don't know, more than 100,000 pounds and the record not coming out, you know, but. It's this kind of experience that is quite, uh, was quite common in, in those years when the major label started to f show signs of weakness, you know, when they actually couldn't do the difference like they were Wh doing before. When was that? Around what time? It was in between 99 and 2002, you know, just the moment when they really went down, you know, and uh, actually we signed to EMI, they sold us to Sony, we were, it was like crazy, I mean, like, and, and we were recording the record with the sound engineer of Chemical Brothers and all this kind of stuff, you know, and uh, suddenly, you know, like, uh, you know, the record is only seventh in the Buds chart, you know, that's not enough, you know, kind of stuff like that, but basically it was just the, the proof that this business was not working anymore. Because I mean, seven position in the bus chart maybe means like 50,000 copies, 100,000 copies, but for a major label, it's peanuts. So they just didn't give a fuck. And uh, uh, for us, as I told you, like it was an amazing experience. It was really like going to school, learning how the music business works, you know. And afterwards, you know, we managed to get the lessons in a good way, and uh, we learned a lot. And we, and our labels back after the disaster of the Jolly Music disaster, somehow the the, the thing that the record didn't come out killed us for a while. Well, everything started to be even better, you know? We just, we just resisted, you know? We were there, we were resistant, and with quality and hard work, you know, like trying to be, you know, in a quality uh, circle, you know? Like, um, you know, things go on anyway. And somehow, even from bad experience like that, you know, we did get some money, we built a studio, now we have a nice studio with a nice office. Without the bad experience, we wouldn't have that. And Pina, the other label, we did, you know. We did it because, I mean, we were uh, facing so many troubles when we were doing the Jolly Music thing, you know. We were, imagine like you get these three guys from the underground, you know, and you put them in the mainstream thing, you know. And we were playing differently. We couldn't even fit in the clubs, you know. We were, we were not even playing four to the floor, classic, you know, house that they wanted us to play. So for us, it was really like a nightmare every time, especially for Mario and Francesco that were the main, you know, guy in the project, you know. and. Uh, you know, but it's it's like that, you know, being underground and just means like learning how to move and go down and rise up again and go down because I mean, that's what we do for a living. And I mean, I'm 35, I'm still here, still doing things, you know, so fuck Sony. I mean, whatever, you know, like we're still here, so. So it's like Melvin Van Peebles Sorry? set? It's like Melvin Van Peebles set. It doesn't matter how often you get down, it matters how often you can get it, up again. Yeah, absolutely, and going down is part of the game. And actually going down is where probably then you get the best music out again, you know, because you're kind of upset. I mean, if, if this is what you do 24 hours a day, clearly. 
if you don't spend, you need lots of energy, you need to be really motivated. So anytime something bad happens, you really have to push hard then, you know, to go back again. But the way you have to do it, that's what you have to do. You have to go up and you have to, you know, make more, make more believe in it, you know, that's how it is. And again, you said it's a negative thing, the jolly music thing. I always m say that it's a negative thing, you know, but when you think about it deeply, that was, you know, we were really lucky, you know, we get some money, like good money. We built a studio, three rooms, office upstairs, kitchen, blah, 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 whatever. I mean, I couldn't do that selling thousand records before, you know, I couldn't do that. We were still playing, you know, in the house, you know, with the neighbor. It was like that. Now, I mean, we have a professional studio, you know, thanks to the deal. And, uh, and we learned how to move in the business, you know, we learned how to push a record a bit more because we saw all the depressive side of it, you know, that behind the success, there are just bullshit, basically. Most of the time, this big company, they force radio to play certain kind of things, you know, they literally force uh, journalists writing certain kind of stuff. It is like that. And we understood that. So we didn't try to force anyone, you know, but we understood that if we were working with professional pro, uh, press agents, you know, in, if you have a good record, this can help because it's much more uh, uh, possible to have the record review in a nice magazine, in a nice column, have an article, interview. So you learn how the business go, you know, and, uh, and that's thanks to, thanks to the Sony EMI uh, failure somehow. But even with a lawyer, you couldn't keep control of your own Listen, project? Listen, I gave my lawyer 20,000 euros, okay, because that was a percentage of the contract. If I want to get control again of the stuff, I should pay that money probably again. I should pay the lawyer to talk to these people. It will take ages. They will kill you like that, you know. So fuck it. Keep the record forever. We make another one. It's jolly music. We will make the jolly music. I mean, on the contract, it says jolly music. So, I mean, you find your way around. I mean, like, it's... But just facing a major label, I'm not going to do it. Next time a major label approaches you, in case this is happening again in the future, give me more. It's really worth getting lots of money, otherwise it's not worth. Stick with the, the independent label and do your stuff and perform and go around and make music. That's what it is, you know, just... These people are just selling smoke most of the time. Shall we listen to some jolly music then? I will play you one of the track. No, I, unfortunately, I don't have the original version that we put out on Nature, but I have one of the version that we redid in the Sony Studios and uh, with, with, with the amazing Steve Dobb, the sound engineer of Chemical Brothers that actually was our best experience there because it, it was teaching us how to mix the tracks properly, blah, blah, blah. I mean, okay, he has a different machines, but... And uh, Erwin Doye from Kings of Convenience is singing on this one. Francesco and Mario are two amazing musicians. I mean, I was really lucky to have been working with them, you know. Even though when I think that the first track that I liked from them, it was a track that by mistake came backwards on the tape. And I called them and said, like, I like this track. I said, what the fuck is this? Track? Was it? The tape was backwards or something, so it was playing backwards. You know, like, yeah, it's a long story. It's a 15 years... Uh, love relationship with them, you know, so. But, but you're still working with them, right? Yeah, Under yeah. different names? Different names, Francesco, they're doing solo projects. Mario lives in Sweden now, and uh, Francesco still in Rome, still in, is still in Rome, and uh, so different projects now, yeah. But you were also like Raiders of the Lost up then? To Mario. Uh, no, Mario alone. No, I, yeah. I've, I've, I'm, I helped them mixing the track and uh, just, you know, just finalizing the tracks and this kind of stuff, you know, but Raiders is just Mario, yeah. And yeah, you mentioned mixing down a track and that you learned how to do it properly in that studio in London. Well, I saw how the big guys do it, you know, but then again, you know, we're, it's not really our field. We never managed. I mean, we spent all our money just buying synthesizers in our life. We never bought a compressor or something. That was, that was a big mistake, actually. You know, we always went like, okay, we have some extra money. Let's buy a Moog. Let's buy another Moog. Let's buy whatever, you know, MS-20, MS-10, you know, this is how we did. So we still have to learn a lot about mixing, you know, and uh, not that we care that much, to be honest, you know, just we love the synthesizer, that's what we do. So if it feels right, it sounds right? Somehow. Or the other way around? Somehow. And what, but what compressor would you buy if you... I don't know, I asked Patrick Pulsic in these cases. <laughs> I sent him an email, hey Patrick, what shall I buy? You know, like that's how I do it. And you will trust him. Because I, be I mean, I believe that, you know, like the music is a bit like in the movies, you know, like it's, uh, you need like, everyone has to do its job, you know, like you can't, you have to know how you should do like a bit of everything, you know, especially now. 
that everything is accessible, you know, even a good mixing desk or whatever, but I still believe that everyone has a role and has to respect it in order to get the best out of it. So you don't master your own tracks then? Uh, if I can do it with someone else that has more uh, skills than me, I do it like that, clearly. Okay. And yeah, maybe we should open the discussion up for some yeah, questions. if there's any questions, especially about labels, if you know. <laughs> You want to know how to make an invoice, how to get money back from a distributor, <laughs> and stuff like that. How whatever. to be prevented of becoming a pop star by mm, a major label. Mm, yeah. They are scared to ask you. Uh, because they know me already. <laughs> yeah, but then your experience with the Academy, maybe, is this something that helped you for your own music as well? Uh, sure, it showed all my limits basically, you know, like when I came here I saw all my limits, you know, because when you meet like, when you stick to the same people all the time, you know, like uh, you're kind of in a safe place, you know, you know what to do, where you have to, you know, where you have to go. Whenever you go to a place with 30 creative people like this, or like the ones last year or two years ago, like always amazing people, always so creative and so talented, you know, you see yourself in a, you have to consider a different, you know, differently what you do and everything, and um, and actually I saw my limits and I decided to uh, improve and spend more time making music and put the business a bit out because that's what the energy that came from there, you know, with you and with other people as well, of course. So if there are no questions, ah, Tony has ah, one. Tony, he's such yeah. a nice guy. <laughs> <laughs> I try to be. Yes, Marco. Um, what is the secret to the kind of creative life and work life balance? What do you mean, sorry? The yeah, in terms of in terms of you running, you know, you've got like a business head obviously and you've got like a studio junkie head. Well, I still don't know, man. I mean I know that whenever I'm doing the business part of it, the creativity always got fucked somehow. Even if I've let's say my accountant tells like, okay, you have to bring all the invoices and stuff, you know, and uh, doing the label you have more papers than if you just work for yourself because you have more stuff to do, you have royal statement and all these kind of things, you know? Whenever I do this kind of stuff, even if the day after I'm free to make music, it doesn't work. You know, you have to wait a little bit and you have to get into the studio again and you have to switch. Maybe the brain works differently when you're doing this kind of stuff and when you do music. So it is difficult, you have to balance somehow, you know? And uh, the, the, the answer sometimes is give, just don't give a fuck about the business, you know? And uh, take care about it later, you know? But then, you know, it's not really working anymore, you know? And are you your own boss? Do you have people working around you, or? I'm sorry? Are you your own boss? Do you have like a... It's just me. I'm surrounded by many amazing guys, but they're useless. <laughs> I mean, they're amazing, inspiring, fun, creative, you know? But in the business thing, you know, it's... Uh, They've been never interested, you know, ne never, never interested in that. So it's like do it yourself by all means, you know. And um, sometimes I really feel tired about it. Okay. So they rather go to the beach than spending an afternoon in an office. Yeah, but that's what I did this summer. I was just reacting to the situation like that. You know, <laughs> I just said, okay, three months, I would just, you know, do that. Hello. Um, uh, three little questions. What do you think? Uh, is it about Rome that something like uh, that could happen 17 years ago with such? Um, I mean, I didn't know about it, but well, um, how come such an energy came up with such an unusual music for the time back then? Yeah. Back then, uh, and what's your favorite B, B movie horror flick out of Italy? Okay. And why is your coffee so good? Okay. The uh, the energy. I think like since as I told you like nothing was happening there musically, you know. Uh, somehow something had to happen, so probably at some point some explosions of energy, it was hidden somewhere underground, you know, like whatever, it happened. I don't know, we always ask ourselves, and why especially it was so dark, you know. Rome is beautiful, weather is beautiful, food is amazing, monuments, history, it's like everything is beautiful. It seems like the music, it's so dark as a kind of reaction, you know, kind of, um, you know, uh, an answer to all this beauty somehow, you know? And um, about the, um, what was the other well, you have ah, the horror of, movie, you have Incubo sulla città contaminata. You have zombies coming out of the plane with guns. It's amazing. 
It's really like, you see, and it's the, it's the scene where there's this plane and there are like zombies coming out like one after each other for like 20 minutes in the scene. Like the plane can, can have, I don't know, like a million zombies in it. And they have guns, rifles and stuff like that. You know, it's really amazing. And it's from Umberto, no, Umberto, Le no, Umberto Lenzi, I think, yeah, Umberto Lenzi, one of the Dario Argento's, uh, you know, uh, partner. And the coffee, do you just keep the... The water. The water? Is it not water. the clean coffee machines? Is it the water? Ah, now you have Italian coffee machines everywhere, come on. So it's, uh, you it's keep the them water. Clean. Huh? But you keep them clean, I think, right? Uh, no, you never clean it. Never. Never wash never, it. You never. never turn it off, right? No, never. Thank you. You're welcome. There's another one. Um, you talked about the spiral tribe and its squad scene. Have you been in touch with it recently? Sorry? Uh, have have you been in touch with it recently? No, no, I've been in touch with them in, I was in touch with them in 95, 96, all this network 23 things, you know. I heard some of them are still in Italy and uh, every now and then they do parties on the mountains, you know, 10,000, you know, people for three days and things like that, you know, but actually, I think they had some problems with all the local scenes, you know, because of yeah. stories that you might know, you know, like that they do, they go in the city and they, uh, they mess around with the wrong people and they've been kicked out of the city and they're kicked out of Naples and everywhere. So they, uh, they're kind of hiding now. And I don't even know, I mean, if they're still actually as a spiral tribe collective still alive. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. There's one in the back, behind you. Hi. Um, I wanted to know what uh, uh, the, the techno scene now in Rome. At the moment, it's really like big. Uh, it was quiet for a while, but then we had this New Year's Eve party that became really, really famous called Amore. And uh, they are doing like 40,000 people, you know, just dancing to reach Ricardo and blah, blah, blah. And uh, so it's very similar to that. So it's mostly like minimal, what they call it minimal, then it's not even minimal, it's just the name now they use it. And it's actually like quite big, you know, and like not, not many clubs, you know, but this kind of stuff now is mostly everywhere, even in clubs where before we didn't, couldn't even enter because the music was so different, you know, and uh, it's much more uh, wide somehow, even though the scene is not really happy anymore, you know, but uh, there are more customers, more uh, people going there, so somehow it's really alive, you know, but I'm out of it, you know, I just live in Rome, sleep, eat, meet friends, that's it. And what about the IDM or experimental scene? Uh, it's it, in Rome, it's kind of gone. It was really big, we had like events that you won't believe, like, I don't know, uh, people listening to... Uh, I don't know, any ex from Warp, you know, there were like two, 3,000 people showing up. Even if we were doing the guys from like Schematic from Miami, you know, like everyone was showing up, you know, like it was really like kind of big, you know, at the festival, the Sonance festival, they always had like this room where they were doing this kind of stuff mainly. Now it's just some special guest, you know, for uh, just a couple of artists, you know, in a night, you know, but it's, it's not there anymore, unfortunately. It's a bit like in the record business, all this kind of stuff, you know, suddenly went a bit the down. To it. Yeah. Um, you you run your your independent label, right? Yep. And you see now now we have all this music download stuff and piracy, people copying CDs all the time and whatever. And even for the the major labels, it's hard to make money out of sales now. How you manage to, to get your label working with, I, the, with I, that? I really do a party when I go break even, you know? Like, most of the time you lose money and you have to DJ and you put this money into the label again. So it's struggling, basically, now. Now, in the last year and a half. Before we were doing okay, we were selling, I don't know, like 2,000, 2,500 copies. It's decent, you know? There's some profit as well for the artist, you know? It's, it's quite okay. Now, I mean, suddenly, like, numbers are changing completely like even though okay it might happen that our music is not as popular as it was maybe two years ago somehow in that field but the numbers change so much you know and uh, clearly you have some income from the digital but digital keeps selling forever somehow so you cannot count that in six months 
So maybe it's some good money coming in, but you have to see in five years, because it's different. When you have a record, you sell it out, and then you make calculations. You know, every six months, you know, more or less, you press, I don't know, 500, 700, and then you decide if you want to repress that. You know, it's much more under control. With digital, you don't know what, what's the income, actually. You know, we had some tracks that came out of digital a year and a half ago, and we started selling them now. I mean, we saw the last reports, and they were suddenly like, I don't know, 200% more, you know? Instead of selling like five in uh, three months, then we saw, I don't know, whatever, like 50. They started picking up somehow, and every three months, they, they bring some money in the, in the machine. But you cannot calculate that, so it's really difficult. So what we do now, we stick to the amount of copies we know we can sell. We won't press, if we know that we can sell 500, we press 300. So we're really safe, because it's the only way to keep going if you're not rich or if you don't just want to waste money, you know? Because otherwise, at the end, it happens that you always have to DJ <laughs> to pay the debts for records, you know? But if you don't make records, then you don't DJ. So it's like, you know, a dog biting his tail, you a know? Vicious like circle. Uh? A vicious yeah, circle. Yeah, it is like that. Then, if you keep doing it, the point that I was telling you, like, even if it's a negative moment, if you keep doing, that at some point the my, my, something might happen you know like a record might make it to a bigger level or you might license it or something can happen so the most important thing is to make a proper plan to keep doing it you know and without losing your uh, you know all your money basically you you press only cds or vinyl as well i actually i don't press cds anymore because my distributor doesn't want to sell it anymore so we're doing digital in a digital format so through itunes beatport uh, whatever else, Juno Download, whatever it is, and we do vinyl. I think we'll do vinyl forever, you know, but we stick to a bit less than the copies that we know we can sell, so that we make sure we don't have any problems, because things that you never consider when you start a label as an independent, an independent with no experience, previous experience, what happens when a record, uh, you press 1,000 and you sell 700, 750, which is good, it's not a big, problem you know it's a it's quite of a decent you know 800 out of thousand you have 200 left at some point if you make the record label and you have more records all these records you have to put it somewhere even the space for the back catalog you know it's a problem so that's why I'm telling you when someone tells me I'm doing the label and it's just digital I say okay you're releasing some stuff it's not doing the label doing the label is thinking about all this things that actually it's kind of difficult, you know? It's um, actually, I, I, one of the area of my office, I rent it to this guy that is our designer. <laughs> Every day I bring some extra box because there are, I don't know, 20 copies coming back from a store somewhere, you know? And it's happening and you have to arrange it and you have to, uh, to, to deal with the returns and the shipping company and arrange like as cheapest possible. It's a lot of things to do. Especially if you're making music, you know, then, you know, you have to deal with this bullshit. Do you want to do that? Are you sure? You know, I'm not really convinced, you know, like now maybe I wouldn't start, you know, so... You do, you do press of vinyls in Italy? Not anymore since 10 years because they were stealing money. I mean, they were changing the price list every week, so I had to change. Uh, typical Italian thing, you know, so... Uh, <laughs> At the moment, I'm working, since few years, I'm working, I've been working with Andalwood Care. It's a company in Berlin that it's not a pressing plant, but they do everything for you. I mean, they take care of the labels, they take, I mean, you do the artwork, then they do, they do the, the printing of the labels, they take care of the pressing, the mastering, you can choose where you want to do it. They work with Exchange in London, they work with uh, Duplates and Mastering in Berlin, or Optimal, or all these companies, and you just work with one, you talk to one person and they do all the processes for you, so it makes it even really easy. And especially if you're selling your record in Europe, they have an amazing deal that they can ship records for free after the, the manufacturer to five countries in Europe. Like let's say Belgium, Holland, like the places where you actually sell records mostly. So it is really, really good. And you can even go to each separate company on your own, even though it's a bigger accounting problem because then you have invoices from each company, so you have to take care of more of the uh, business aspect in that, in that case. And it's not even cheaper. Actually, working with them, it's really, really good. I'm not doing promotion for them, it's just like a service, you know? Like they do a service and it's amazing. You just send them the master artwork and they give you the, the uh, they tell you like in two weeks or something. They send What's you the, the name again? Handle with care. Later I will tell you the name, give you the web page, you know? And right. there are also other companies doing that, but those guys are really professional. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more? No one? 
Then let's call. Ah, sorry, there's one. Um, um, what do you think the future of the vinyl is gonna be? Do you think it's gonna be there forever? Or? It's gonna be there forever, collectible. So not many, but still, I mean, will always be there. Because I, I believe quite, you know, music will probably be for free in about a few years, you know, subscriptions and stuff like that, you know, but you know, there are people that still love to uh, to do this thing, you know, and open I the know, record. I do. I do. We'll always, I do. <laughs> but I, I mean, wonder what will happen. There will be like limited edition, like amazing packaging and stuff like that. This will always be there. Maybe CD will disappear because, I mean, as far as digital, I go for the the one that I can actually get it whenever I want. And right. it's still numbers. It's not music anymore. So. That's it. Okay. Grazie. Thank you very much, Mr. Marco Pazzarani.